Welcome everyone. Guten Abend. Good evening. At least it's evening where and when I am and wherever you are and whenever you are seeing this it may not be. Today a lecture on Kant on radical evil as we find it in his seminal essay Religion within the boundaries of mere or bare reason. I have another lecture on my channel on original sin in the same text which you perhaps may also want to consider listening to after this one or before this one where I go into in more detail what the book is about so I won't do this here. In this lecture I shall address the origin of radical evil which Kant sees in unchecked self-love. Self-love it seems cannot emerge in isolation Hence, evil occurs, as some have argued, in and through our social relations and ambitions. There has been a trend for quite some time to presume that Kant is Rousseauian. Again, whether any such label, slapping a label on a thinker, make any sense at all, you know, looking for influence, etc., is itself questionable and must be addressed some other time, for this labeling reveals something profoundly odd about academic analytical philosophy. In fact, what it does is it diverts very often this way of labeling and inventing new terms, diverts from the issue and the question at hand and is a gatekeeper, a gatekeeper mechanism against entering into thinking because all of a sudden we're trapped within a cobweb of labels and whether the label is rightly or wrongly applied, etc., etc., and all the other shine probleme, these mere semblance of problems that then need to be solved, etc., ad infinitum. Alan Wood is presumably one of the best known analytical Kant scholars who makes this assertion. I shall address his claims here, followed by my close reading of transcendental radical evil. Before I can begin to do so, let me briefly point out that according to Kant, finite human beings can neither be diabolically evil nor angelically good. The devil is as unfree in his revolt against the moral law as are angels in their perfect subjection to that law. Moreover, freedom for Kant is not lawless, but means to subject oneself to the moral law while not crowding out incentives of self-love self -love either. At least since his seminal work, Kant's Ethical Thought, published I think for the first time in 1999, Ellen Wood has argued that our quote, propensity to humanity, end of quote, which expresses itself in ambition, is the origin of evil. As we are ambitious to enjoy higher social standing than others, our need for communal life turns into what Wood has called unsocial sociability. Wood equates Kant's theory of radical evil with Rousseau's assumption that man is born good but corrupted by society. More precisely, the Rousseauian view is that man is good, this is a quote from Wood, good in the natural, i.e. pre-social state, as Wood argues. Rousseau thus considers, continues would quote, all human wickedness and misery to be the consequence of the social condition. In society, our ambition drives us to, quote, competitive self-worth, end of quote. This drive to compare our self-worth, Wood claims, is, and a quote again from Wood, in Kant's view, the radical propensity to evil in human nature. For Wood, as he writes, and I continue to quote him here, evil is thus a product of society, end of quote, in the sense that the social condition provides a necessary context for developing our radical propensity to evil. That was another quote from Wood. Note a propos that Kant, to my knowledge, nowhere uses the term, quote, radical propensity. It is, it seems, an invention from Wood, and in fact, one that adds to the pseudo problem at hand. In sum, Wood maintains that Kant in the religion equates the source of moral evil to the human ambition to be competitively better than others. Moral evil originates every time human beings socialize, which they inevitably must do. 
However, radical evil is not decided in experience, I would argue, or in so-called in a, any so-called social context. In fact, just a propos, the notion of society itself is already a reification of the various relations, hierarchies, roles, etc. humans interact with and are bound by. For Kant, radical evil does not emerge in social contexts a posteriori. We are dealing here with the question of a Vernunftreligion, a rational religion, not sociability. Instead, radical evil is there in potentia and is actualized also a priori and transcendentally when the moral law calls upon the subject. The way in which the moral law, sorry, the moral subject acts in social relations to stay with that image of wood is profoundly dependent upon the a priori arrangement of Triebfedern, of the driving forces or the driving springs, perhaps also the incentives which form the Gesinnung, the attitude, the outlook, the, the character of the subject, which in turn form or inform the subject's behaviors, such as ambition. But this radical evil, as we shall see, that's decided for on the noumenal plane. But let us begin by assessing the widespread association of Kant with Rousseau. Does Kant really approve of Rousseau's thought experiment of the golden state of nature? as Wood and others, I think, claim. This would be quite foreign to Kant's thinking, as the golden state is a reified presupposition that is not logical, but supposed as historical, and hence outside the bounds of mere reason, which is what Kant is after in the religion. To say that Rousseau is influenced, sorry, to say that Rousseau influenced Kant does not say much at all. In fact, it says very little, almost nothing. If anything, Kant flatly rejects, if you allow me the label, the Rousseauian assumption that man is good in the natural state. Kant even refers to Hobbes's natural state of the bellum omnum contra omnis. He refers to that in the religion, however, the way in which he does is again not in a historical fashion or even in a thought experimental fashion, but in a sense that it in terms of where there is no moral law, in terms purely by the, the dictates of reason, there must be a war of all against all. Not really, not historically, not even as a thought experiment, but purely deduced from the a priori principles of reason itself. So this is important to notice, I think. Kant demands, and I quote from Kant here, from religion, that the human being ought to leave the ethical state of nature in order to become a member of an ethical community. So, I quote here from Michelson's book, Fallen Freedom, Kant thus flatly rejects Rousseau's notion that an original good human nature is corrupted by society, as though culpability resides in something that overrides individual accountability. But even this, I think, goes too far you know, talking about individual accountability, etc., etc. It, it's again, what we're looking at are the dictates of bare reason itself in terms of religion. That's what we're after. Furthermore, Kant, and this, this is always the difficulty, is that, you know, there's so much brought into Kant that isn't there. You know, but we're looking for examples of how can we apply the categorical imperative. The categorical imperative is not to be applied. It's not a tool. It's not a hammer that you walk around with, hammering, is, is this, can I do this with the categorical imperative? No, you don't do anything with it. It's decided on the plane of thinking. Anyways, furthermore, Kant is at times highly critical of Rousseau. In the religion, he claims, well, sorry, he calls him a moralist. And in the second critique, in one of his more cynical moments, perhaps, Kant attacks, and I like these attacks, Schiller, he attacks Schiller and Rousseau both as, quote, novelists and sentimental educators whose enthusiasm or infatuation, Schwärmerei in German, he finds dangerous at best. You'll find this on page 86 of the second critique. A more subtle argument against Rousseau and 
the dogma of man's natural goodness is Kant's, if you like, modification of the innate goodness thesis. And I quote at length from Kant, if it is said the human being is created good, this can only mean nothing more than he has been created for the good and the original Anlage, predisposition in him is good. The human being is not thereby good as such, but he brings it about that he becomes either good or evil, according as he either incorporates or does not incorporate into his maxims the incentives, the springs, the drives contained in that predisposition. And this must be left entirely to his free choice. Kant here echoes, end of quote obviously, Kant here echoes what he had argued for in the second critique and, sorry, in his critique there of Epicurus. Quote from Kant, for Epicurus, like many men even now who are morally well-meaning, committed the mistake of already presupposing the virtuous outlook, attitude or view, the Gesinnung, the character in the person. Again, don't look so much about what he says about Epicurus, it doesn't matter that much. Pre presupposition, that's that's the issue. The presupposition, again, the, the golden state is a ratified presupposition of a supposed historical context. I mean, if anything, with Kant, you know, you should. That's if anything you learn from from reading any Kant or listening to anything, is that Kant is a philosopher who well, there's more to it, of course, who first. Uh, well, destroys ontology, destroys hypostasis, and destroys reification. The only things one can presuppose are the predisposition to the good in the a priori, and the propensity to evil. But it is only when the moral subject, quote, has respect, achtung, for the moral law as being of itself a sufficient incentive or drive to the power of choice and of quote that the subject can form for itself a virtuous gesinnung, a virtuous, say, character. Humans are not simply good by birth and are then made evil by some external source. The crucial point is that the moral subject is the author, as Kant writes, of her gesinnung. The moral subject freely determines its character. When Kant defines gesinnung as not Quote, earned in time, not earned in time. He means to say that it is acquired by timeless, intelligible, hence transcendental acts. Good and evil, good and evil are there in potentiality and are actualized within the subject by its deliberate arrangement of driving forces. It is thus precisely the free, intelligible choice, not so much of the driving forces, but in the arrangement of the order of those incentives, which determines whether the moral subject earns a Gesinnung that is good or evil, a character, let's say. Why is the order, the form, more important than the matter, the content of the driving springs, the Triebfedern? This is so because for Kant, human beings cannot be good and evil at the same time. You cannot be good sometimes and evil other times. It's outlined above, humans are not angels, humans are not devils. Hence it is impossible that the moral subject only incorporate the incentives of the moral law and entirely bans self-love incentives. Therefore, what is crucial in determining whether man be good or evil, as Kant says, is not the matter of the incentives, but the order in which the moral subject arranges the drives, the driving springs. I know this sounds very strange in English, but uh, that's what it, the, the most direct translation of Triebfeder is, driving springs, the driving forces, if you like. So, again, it doesn't matter so much the specific content, but the arrangement of the form. That is to say, there are incentives, formally speaking, driving forces, formally speaking, from the moral law. What the, what the moral law says, leave that aside. And from self-love. The arrangement of that is crucial. If the moral law takes the lead, there will be incentives, let's say, of self-love beneath the moral law, being pulled or led by the moral law. Hence, that 
particular subject is good. If self-love, however, leads and the moral law is subjected to it, you can't ever completely repudiate the moral law because we're not diabolical. It's still there. But for example, it can be corrupted. It can be corrupted in such a way that we use the moral law to get ahead in life, right? You know, but this is a very practical, I mean, you know, experiential example just to illustrate this a bit, but this is not really what's going on in Kant. But let's say this is what, what's, what's being done. So then the moral law is subjected to self-love. That is the moment when that human being is, to a certain degree, evil. So that's the, so the form, the order, is, is more important than the matter of the intent, and the, the order in which the, say, the incentives, um, the driving forces, etc., are arranged. So this entirely intelligible choice, intelligible meaning in the a, is a priori, determines the subject's maxime. I won't go into the categorical imperative here, but it's, that's the maxime that relates back to the maxime of the categorical imperative, which should be a generalizable law. And here we find what the generalizable law is, which is the moral law itself leading, formally speaking, over self-love incentives, which are also there because you know you do need to wash yourself when you get up in the morning, um, and other things, of course. <laughs> so that 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 leadership of the moral law is again is formal because the content comes in then, if you like, a posteriori in experience, but it is formal a priori. That's where it all occurs. That's, that's what's at stake. So, yes, all right. Uh, this entirely into uh, whenever and for whatever reason, inscrutable because it is free, individual, and internal or intelligible, a priori choice that is made transcendentally, the moral subject decides to subordinate the moral law to the incentives of self-love as I've just been describing. He or she makes herself evil. The moral subject thereby determines the character of her gesinnung. However, how, how, her, her, her sensing character, her sensing outlook on the world. However, if the moral law forms one's fundamental incentives, drives, etc., then one is internally morally good, a priori. One then does not act merely according to the moral law by the letter, but has internalized it. Right. So that, that would be only be what Kant calls fulfilling the letter, that's in the second critique. That say according to its matter, you see, but one is coerced by the moral law instead. So you see, one can fulfill the letter, a posteriori of the moral law, can be very moral in one's appearance, hyper-moral even, even and, and, and proclaim morality and, and the current morale of, of the day and shout about it from all roofs. But that's just fulfilling the letter. What really is guiding that is internally is still not clear. Could even actually be self-love that drives one to just fulfill the letter. The one who really lives according to the moral law follows it formally, seeing the content formed through the form a posteriori in experience and doesn't proclaim the moral law as it were. If self-loves so self-love forms one's highest incentives that one is coerced by one's egoistic drives, as I said before. Besides what somewhat, I would say, misguided focus on ambition, a term Kant uses only once in the religion and tellingly defines it as originating out of self-love, Wood is misled, I think, by the following assertion from Kant, and I quote in, from Kant, out of this self-love originates the inclination to gain worth in the opinion of others. From this arises gradually an unjust desire to acquire superiority for oneself over others. So this could be read, I admit, as saying that there is an incentive to be ambitious and overpower others in social situations, turning everything into a social 
un an unsocial sociability, whatever the term was before. But the crucial aspect here, I think, is not so much that we corrupt each other, a posteriori, inexperience, as would beliefs, but why we do so. Kant's answer is this, the urge to compare ourselves with others which leads to the vices of, quote, jealousy and rivalry, as Kant says, originates out of self-love. And when is that decided for? Not in social situations. That's committed, as it were, a priori. Only if one chooses self-love incentives as the highest incentives above the moral law, formally speaking, as you know, to form one's maxim, upon which one acts, does the moral subject then wish to acquire, quote, superiority for oneself over others, end of quote. Note that Kant does not condemn self-love per se, as Wood condemns ambition as the alleged source of evil. Self-love is a necessary trait of being human. So Kant does not deny bodily needs at all. As beings, we, né, who are also physical, have physical needs and desires they need to take care of. Kant explicitly writes, quote, to incorporate self-love into one's maxim is natural, for who would not want that things go well for him? End of quote from Kant. Yet if the moral subject forms her highest incentives out of natural self-love, which serves to preserve oneself as a creature of nature, then she makes her gesinnung, her sensing character, evil. Then all her actions are coerced by self-love, e.g. in the form, for example, sorry, in the form of pleasure-seeking egoism and utter disrespect for the moral law and fathers. It is this evil, as Kant says, which Kant defines as, quote, radical, since it corrupts the ground of all maxims. End of quote. This is how Kant understands radical, as you probably already know, that radical comes from the Latin word radix, meaning root. This understanding and Kant's admittedly ambivalent formulations that I just quoted have led commentators such as Mike Carlson to equate radical evil with original sin. There's another lecture on my channel on this matter, so go look for that. There will be a link somewhere, I suppose. The crucial step in Kant's argument, however, is that the propensity to evil, the Hang zum Bösen, is not and cannot be per se morally evil and is not what Kant means by radical evil. That is, not all moral agents are equally evil inherited from Adam's original sin. Radical evil is not a debility, a malum metaphysicum, it's not metaphysical evil at all that affects all moral subjects equally. Rather, radical evil is self-chosen. The propensity to evil must be distinguished from what Kant means by radical evil. That's very important. So, propensity to evil, that's there. The propensity to evil means to, to self-love above the moral law. That means we're free in this decision, a priori, in a transcendental manner, in a noumenal. But, but, radical evil is self-chosen. That comes about when the propensity to evil has been decided to take the lead over the moral law in formal terms. Radical evil is then not a debility, it's not a malum metaphysicum, not a lack, not a deficiency that affects all moral subjects equally, quite the opposite. Radical evil is self-chosen, as I just said. Only the propensity to evil, not evil itself, is there a priori within every subject. There's only by the deliberate choosing of self-love, driving forces, as her highest incentives, does the moral subject actualize her propensity to evil to the level of radical evil. One makes oneself evil at the root. Mere ambition originating out of self-love could not explain this radical self-corruption. Radical self-corruption. Again, not by any content. There is so to, to, to be ambitious against others. That's content there's, there's a matter, there's subject matter there, you know? It, it I want to get ahead in life. I need I want to get this title and blah 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 blah. I need to get this house, he wants to have that, that amount of money, and all this stuff. That's already, that's the, that's, there's a material basis, if you like, for this. 
There isn't one in the formal decision to let self-love drive. And I know this is, you know, difficult to understand, but we are, we are trying to think here, not about people in their life worlds, in their actual everyday lives, but about the possibility of freedom and evil. That's what we're thinking through here. And this, is, this seems to be lost on so many who read philosophy these days because they think that this is something that they can, they can just take and then apply to just any, any odd situation they can come up with. And if, or, or you can come up with some abstract example of, but what about this one time and this could have been blah, 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 blah. What about this possible world, but blah, 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 blah. And all of this is just abstraction leading absolutely nowhere. What this is trying to do here is to marry the abstract with the concrete. And the other examples are actually abstractions from the concrete away to more abs baseless abstraction generating an utter abysmal groundlessness. And I'm not sorry for saying that. You know, so, so, at some point, some sense needs to come back to academic philosophy or it's just gone. It is just utterly gone. If it's just, if this is what it's coming up with, what are you even doing? Because it is a form of corrupting thinking. And I have no issue saying this because I'm free. So I've argued in the previous lecture that solely on the intelligible plane, before any experience, that means outside memory. There is no memory of this action. For Kant, there are degrees of evil, and only the perverted heart, as he calls it, is truly radically evil to the fullest. The lowest degree is the weak heart, defined as, quote, frailty of human nature. The second lowest is the impure heart, where the moral subject mixes the moral law with incentives of self-love. Yet only if there is a, quote, perversion of the human heart is the human being designated as evil, end of quote. Such a heart is called perverse, for, quote, it reverses the ethical order as it relates to the incentives of a free power of choice, end of quote. The moral subject of a self-created perverse Gesinnung, the sensing character, might even wish and be able to appear to seem morally good because she assumes that she will benefit from it. Hence Kant warns that being morally good or evil is only intelligible and cannot be determined empirically. Quote from Kant, the empirical character is then not good, sorry, the empirical character is then good, but the intelligible character is still evil. The greatest danger for the moral law is, argues Kant, is not the natural inclinations that merely lack discipline and openly display themselves unconcealed to everyone's consciousness, but is rather, as it were, a secret enemy, one who hides behind reason and is hence all the more dangerous. Yet, do we ever see the intelligible character of the other? On which plane would that be possible? Again, the intelligible decision to privilege drives from self-love above the moral law happens outside experience and also hence without eye, without any eye toward experience or the empirical or the, the, the content. The moral subject does not one day withdraw from life in order to rearrange its incentives just to get ahead in the great game of social ambition, as some people seem to suggest. On the intelligible plane, there is no such reference to the empirical. Again, do we ever see the intelligible character of others, or even of our own? What is this intelligible noumenal plane on which these things are decided? But let me go in a different direction now. The truly evil moral subject, is thus the one who hides his perverted heart behind a masquerade of reason. This masquerade persuades his peers that he's trustworthy, while he merely abuses his own and others' rational capacities. Radical evil for Kant is thus not at all a debility, but precisely that kind of dangerous evil of strength that even comes across as rational. Schelling will argue something very much along those lines in his treatise on the essence of human freedom, which you will also find a lecture on on this channel. 
It is, quote, a species, this is from Kant, of rationally, sorry, this is a quote from Wood, actually, a good one. It is a species of rationally motivated unreason. I think he rightly names it this way. The radical evil subject, the radically evil subject, apologies, abuses reason as a mere tool, a chi of deception, to gain an advantage for herself in accordance with the needs of her egoistic self love. The Kantian Gesinnung, the sensing character, be it morally good or morally evil, is thus not something plainly visible, but the internal moral outlook, his or her fundamental but self-given moral attitude. Kant understands that even when there is, quote, this reversal of the heart to perversion, there can still be legally good actions, empirically good actions, if the mind's attitude is thereby corrupted at its root, end of quote from Kant. That is to say, the moral Gesinnung is here radically corrupted. So the question I think that Wood cannot answer and others is why our sociability turns unsocial. I don't think that there's a, an address here to this deeper cause of the evil Gesinnung. It's a bit of a reductionism, if you like. But I don't think that it's just a reductionism of Kant's radical evil, but a complete conflation of its source. Again, it's self-chosen. It is only from the wrong, the misguided, the misordered incentive structure that the moral agents need for sociability can turn into unsocial sociability. Only then, a posteriori, do they corrupt one another morally as they are coerced by their primary incentive to only act according to the demands of crude egoism. It is not society that delivers the context for their propensity to evil to develop into moral evil. It is society, if you like, you want to have a slogan that springs from the way in which moral agents in the kingdom of ends form their ends, as it were. Rather, it is from their evil gesinnung, right? So that this Im 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 uh, originates. So from individual moral regeneration, the true internalization of the moral law, moral subjects can create the, quote, ethical community that Kant envisions in a religion. From the ahistorical, noonal plane of rationality, however. Which is, again, also introduced to free from the necessity of having been touched by revelation. There will be human beings who have never seen revelation. Are they to end up in hell? Or do they also have a place in the rational kingdom somewhere? So, there is a merciless element in Kant, perhaps, as well, insofar as there is no memory of this, of this, of this choice of to, towards radical uh, self-corruption uh, and when it occurs. But again, that would be that would be looking at it, I think, again, also from an, from an a posteriori stance. What we're thinking through here is not really, you know, as always as the human beings in their life world, etc., but is, is, a, is a formalistic, a priori, deduction of rational principles of religiosity and evil. And that in itself, that in itself has brings with it certain aporias. But those aporias cannot be solved, if you like, in, in, in a posteriori in experience, but they must be thought through dialectically. So I leave you with this. As always, thank you very much for listening. And if you'd like to support the work on this channel, just do this with any way you can by following the link. Links in the description of this video Thank you very much indeed.